All right. So on the surface, you wouldn't expect that, you know, public health discussions would have much to do with running a business or running a football club or running any kind of sports organizations. Uh, but probably over the last few weeks, there's been a mass education uh, in statistics. Uh, and I know Rasmus watching the government daily briefings, as you do, and, uh, and the numbers that come out of that. Uh, one number in particular is, has caught your eye. What is that? No, yeah. So, like, I think, like everyone else, I've been following the the government updates, and uh, and I think it's been interesting to see, you know, the conversation around data. You know, you suddenly you had like prime ministers and prime time presenting algorithms and models. I mean, who would have thought that? Um, and uh, but but I think it's it's interesting, and it's you know the conversation about what data tells you something about what has happened and what data is telling you something about what is likely to happen in the future. Um, and in particular, as you say, there's, there, there's kind of one number that seems to be like almost the godfather of Corona stats, which is uh, the R number. Um, so the R number, you know, talks about like, um, you know, how, how many people is, does, does, does each infected person pass on the virus to? And, and um, if, if that number remains below zero as I, uh, below one as I've understood you, you're kind of okay, yeah. but if it goes above one, you, 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 the, the problem will, it, is likely to, 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 to spin out of control. Uh, so, so it's kind of become like a, a, a great metric for kind of, you know, monitoring, um, monitoring the, the response to, to, to the disease. And I think, you know, every business should really have an R number you know, and we can, maybe we can discuss what that is in, in other businesses, in particular in football. Yeah, it's interesting because obviously the, the, for want of a better phrase, the kind of output metric that um, you can look at and is reported every day is, is obviously the deaths uh, and cases. Um, but there is, a, there is a significant time lag on that. Uh, you know, it's, it can take a couple of weeks and take a month uh, for those numbers to come out. And so, um, you know, if you look at the way that, coronavirus accelerated through the community um, in with respect to cases and deaths obviously the problem was kind of should have been or would have been identified earlier if we'd known I guess more about the R number say in the UK in, in late February or, or early March um, but but going back to moving away because I don't think either of us are public health experts we're probably more more comfortable in in the space of, of, of business and football um, yeah just the concept I think of any business you know in terms of that there are clear outputs that they have, so their revenues, their costs, and so on. Um, and, and those are the ones that are always reported and always the ones that are public facing. But actually, they don't always tell the underlying health of a business. And I know you've kind of spoken about different underlying leading statistics that, that companies can have um, that can that get ahead of the revenue and, and predict revenue ultimately. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what, what I think the R number tells us about what, what a good metric looks like is that it, it kind of helps you identify the need for change or I, I, I helps help you detect the problem before it spins out of control. Because as you say, there is this time delay between uh, cause, cause and effect. Mm-hmm. And, and that time delay is exists in kind of any organization, I think. And the more complex, the bigger the organization is, the, 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 the bigger that time delay is. So if, I mean, the outcomes you have in April is not a result of something you did in April. It's a result of something you, you kind of did, you know, months, maybe even years back. So, so you want an R number to be able to, um, to kind of tell you if you have a problem before it becomes obvious and too late to fix. Um, and, and I think it kind of, it kind of um, opens that conversation about, leading versus lagging indicators, which is um, a common, common um, term to use within management theory. So basically, uh, leading indicators tells you something, they're predictive, they tell you something about where you're going, whereas lagging indicators are, are kind of pointing to the past, tells you something about what has happened up until this point. So like you could give a really simple example. Um, if you wanted to lose weight, for example, you can measure your weight. That's kind of a lagging indicator. It tells you something about how you've done up until this point, or you can measure how many calories do you burn per day, how many calories you, you eat per day. That's leading indicator. It tells you something about where you're likely to go. And I think in businesses and when we run organizations, we tend to be 
maybe too focused on the lagging indicators like revenue, sales, costs, you know, but they, they don't give us much information about what we need to do to be successful in the future. So we need to be better looking at, 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 at leading indicators. And, I, and it's a really indis- uh, interesting conversation about how you go about identifying those, uh, those leading indicators in, in, in an organization. Yeah, so you've written about this a little bit, and I think um, one of the interesting ones um, you pointed out to me before is imagine you're running a restaurant and, um, you know, you've, say you've built up a reputation, you've got people coming in, um, but sometimes, you know, restaurant business can take a bit of time to adapt or things can change over a slow period of time. What, if you're running a restaurant, what are some of the things that might tell you about what the future business is going to look like in six months' time? Yeah, it was just, I mean, yeah, I mean, you almost want to, I think the, the, the main thing with metrics is that you, you should not start with the metric, you should start with the goal. You know, you know we've seen that in, you know, we've seen that in football, uh, you and I, uh, over, over the past like five, ten years, that you had all these metrics coming in, for example, possession stats, all retention metrics. But, you know, they were not really predictive of the outcome, you know, winning, winning football games. So, so what's happened in football in the past few years is that we found some some more reliable metrics to predict outcomes than than just how how, how much of the time you actually have the ball, and um, and I think that's a that's kind of a key thing that you, you should not start with the metric you should start with what is the outcome and then you you work yourself back from there. So if you run a restaurant, you probably want that restaurant to be like profitable. What what drives that? That's probably your customer satisfaction what kind of drives your customer satisfaction score. And that's, your, that's a leading indicator. That could be the time from delivery to, oh, sorry, from, from, from the customer order the food to the food is delivered. And, and you want to keep that you know, pretty, pretty, pretty low, that number. Um, they want, you want them to have the, the food quickly. So you can monitor that. And um, you might start, you know, slipping a little bit and it starts taking longer from people all the food until you deliver it and, and that won't show up in your customer s- score right away i mean there's time delay but but if you monitor that number it helps you detect the problem before it goes into your customer satisfaction score and then it pops up on your financial statement and then it might be too late to change because the customers have decided to go eat somewhere else so i think this is just an example of how you you, you got to break you got to break down um you know the metrics, but you got to start with the with, with with your goal in mind, and then 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 go from there. Yeah, I can imagine putting yourself in the mind of the customer there, where you know it used to be that service was great, and then you go one time and it's not as good, and the next time it's even worse, and then eventually you decide to fall off. And it that period in which it was dropping off the the time to delivery, they were still coming, but then eventually it, it goes away. And it, the kind of the analogy in sport and and sport is kind of the best sports, which, you know, I you know, often think football, football is certainly one of them, if not the number one, the king of sports, is the ones where that creates that disconnect between the input and the output because there's the unpredictability element to it. And so kind of analogous to the customer, there might be a time where you scored a 30-yard screamer and then you scored a 30-yard screamer, but it actually went in off the crossbar that the next time. And yeah. then the third time it just goes into the stands and the fourth time it goes into the stands and so on. And that's, that's the kind of the, the methods um, or the kind of disconnect between in, uh, input and, and output in, uh, in sport. Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, you, in, in football in particular, you have this big factor of randomness, uh, which means that over the course of a season, like randomness can easily swing the, po- the number of points you earn, like 10, 15 points in that direction, or 10, 15 points in the other direction. So it's probably more important uh, than almost like in any other, other industry to, to find a good kind of R number to look at in football that helps you, um, uh, you know, monitor the, the, the underlying improvements or the underlying decline in your performances so you can make good decisions on that. That's where, you know, the clubs I held run, we, 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 we have, um, you know, a rating number, you know, we, we have, you know, there's all these expected points and expected goals models that, you know, works as a better metric in many respects than, than the league table um, because, because of the randomness. And I think, that, you know, what you ultimately want to do 
is you want to make sure that you don't drive change when you should stick to the plan. And you also want to make sure you don't stick to the plan when you should drive change. And, and, and having that, uh, you know, having like a really robust R number to look at, like helps you make better decisions, I think, especially because football is such a emotionally heated industry. It's so, you know, for me, it's, it's football is, it's a lot about making pretty simple decisions under maximum pressure. You know? and, yeah. and I think that's, that's where sometimes when the storm is on, that's why you, you, you really need to have identified your, 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 the metrics that, that, that you are important to you. Yeah, I can think of um, a really good example, which is, which is Man United looking at the period of kind of 2011 to 2014. Um, so obviously they finished second to Man City that, that Aguero season in, in 2011-12 and they scored 89 points. Uh, and then the following season, they won the league. So they, they kind of ostensibly improved on their, on their performance. They won 89 points again. Um, and, and there were a couple of things going on. So firstly, uh, their goal difference actually went down that season. They, they, their goal difference was 13 worse in the year that they won the league. Uh, and so they were winning a few, a few more games by narrow margins. Uh, but talking about kind of underlying metrics, United were coming from behind a lot that season. So I think they went behind in 16 matches and they won 29 points from those matches. So pretty much a third of their points came from matches in which they went behind. And some people might think that bounce back ability, um, you know, coming from behind it is an R number because it's showing kind of mental fortitude and so on. But actually it's the inverse because bad teams go behind more often good teams tend to go ahead and then just kind of cruise out again. Bad teams are conceding goals, conceding goals, obviously an indication of a, of a bad team. Uh, and so that kind of mental fortitude, and I have no doubt, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson, probably the greatest British manager of all time, had something to do with the fact that United could come from behind in games. But if you look at the data, it's just not sustainable. Uh, and so United were repeatedly falling behind in games, coming from behind and, and getting wins by 3-2 or by 2-1 by or, or, or whatever. Uh, and so that was an indication that things weren't necessarily perfect. And then, and then, of course, you can go down the sophisticated routes, which is look at things like expected goals numbers, where, you know, they were probably on expected goals, i.e. the quality and quantity of chances that they'd created were probably roughly the third best team in the league that year. And, you know, you were talking about the 15, 20 point swings that that can happen in football. That does seem to be the case with United. And look, there's no doubt that the following season, you know, David Moyes, yeah, so it was a big, big shoes to fill with Sir Alex, and there's no doubt that their performance dropped off as well. Um, but there were there were a series of R numbers, some numbers that looked like R numbers but weren't R numbers, were actually kind of almost like nefarious liars um, uh, about their performance that um, precipitated the drop off. And uh, you know, there's countless examples of, of performance like that in football. Yeah, it's like you know, I've, I've, I recently read a, an interesting article about something within so social media called like vanity metrics mm. uh, so and it kind of talks you know I, i've just it made, it made me think of that because you mentioned that sometimes you think it's an r number but it's not really an r number but vanity metrics are like you know if you if you have a facebook profile likes how many likes how many shares how many comments how many followers all these things but you know what what actually does that lead to does it does it mm. does those things actually um, lead to what you want to achieve, which might someone buying your product, or, or mm. which, is, which is ultimately why you, you're doing all these marketing activities. So vanity metrics, I think, is a good good expression of you know sometimes you think you you you, you have an, an important metrics, but it it doesn't really it's not really the right metrics to to look at. Um, just going back to you know just quick comment on your on on your United example. I think in football, um, there, there are like two two different extremes you have to deal with and, and it's very different, different psychological challenges. You have the example you probably mentioned there where you get like, you're lucky, uh, you, you, you get maybe 10, 10, 12 points more than the underlying performance just justified. Um, you know, how do you deal with that? You know, because everyone thinks you're a genius. Uh, and you, you have to, if you run a, if, you, if you're in a management team that you always got to, you know, really be pushing people on the inside to say, listen, we, we, we need to, we need to improve the performance because this is not going to be sustainable. Um, and then you've got the other uh, extreme where you maybe get 10, 15 points uh, less than you deserve. 
and everyone wants to 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 set the manager and uh, and and have big revolutionary change within the club. And you almost gotta like give people confidence that if you keep doing what you're doing, you know, it will regress to the mean. Things will change in in in, in your favor. We had this example at um, mm-hmm. at uh, if um, uh, some years back. Uh, we we finished fourth that season. Um, I think every all, all the fans were were ready to uh, to throw, throw the coach you know out the window and uh, and but the underlying numbers were pretty pretty solid actually um, and and we st- we stuck with him and and in the next season we won the championship with a record num- number of points and it, it's just like you know I've been through these situations quite a few times now and you, you your brain is not designed to you know your brain is designed to build a narrative so you also try and find it's very difficult to accept randomness as an explanation for anything mm. um, and so so that's where you really want that like have have a have have a culture where you have trust in in your key metrics because that's gonna you know have you st- st- stick to the plan when it's actually right to stick to the plan and and um, and not get um, not get distracted by all the emotions around you yeah and, and and to go up a level i think that's where it's really important to have an evidence-based culture where you know if 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 you've only got one or two people who have got access to the numbers within an organization and they're trying to beat the drum about you know why this is the r number as it were it's very difficult to get that to pervade through to everyone's decision making because everyone's mora- everyone if they're not haven't got access to the numbers their morale dips they, they can't focus on their roles they, they feel the pressure of the fans and so on but if there is communication throughout the organization about what you're trying to achieve how you're measuring what you're trying to achieve i think it can uh, it can make a big difference in terms of decisions what do you think about because we talk about like expected goals expected points metrics uh you know underlying 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 rating uh, um to kind of on a strict you know talk about the big decisions like you yeah. know when should you change when should you stick to the plan what do you, what do you think if you just go one step and what, let's get below that and say, like, what, what would be kind of some of the R numbers you would measure there? Would that be like, um, you know, interest into the final third? Um, mm. um, you know, you expect the goals from different phases of the games, you know, because it, you know, expect the goals metrics kind of measure what every football team, despite its style of play, have in common. They want to create as many high scoring. Uh, high probability scoring position as possible and prevent your position for, for doing that against you. You know, so, but, but if you then go, go a step further than that, you know, what are some of the key metrics you think you, as a football club you should, you should look at? Yeah, I think the key, the key principles is try and strip away as much randomness that might exist within any given process. So the reason expected goals works is because there is a huge amount of randomness in finishing. So on any one day, you know, the reason... Lionel Messi doesn't score every single penalty he takes is because it's impossible to hit the ball in the perfect spot every single time and nail it into the top corner. You know, we talk about the greatest footballers who'd ever lived here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so y- y- if you want to take a step back from expected goals, what are some of the elements that might continue to be a little bit random? So even things like, uh, and these might not be the right metrics, but sometimes winning a corner can be a little bit random. It's not always correlated with um, you know, how, good, how good a team is. Um, looking at things like, as you say, getting the ball into the final third, making kind of forward penetrative passes into into central areas. Um, something like that is a real skill and good teams will repeatedly do that over a period of time. Bad teams might accidentally do it in some matches. But, you know, if teams are doing that consistently, then in the long run, they, they will probably begin to create more chances. And, and if they create more chances, they'll score more goals and they score more goals and rise up the league table. And we've all, like, the thing is, you know, everything we're saying here, I think, probably resonates with a football fan. Like, you, you, we've all seen games where we've played well, you know, we've got the ball into dangerous areas, we've created good chances, but not, not won. And I think, um, you know, this isn't, this isn't some kind of voodoo, right? It's, it's, all, it's all kind of in the, in the makeup and the language and the kind of feeling of, of the game. One, one other... Uh, example I was thinking of um, so we do a lot obviously uh, of working golf as well with our 15th club um, brand and um, another ranking so we talk about the league table often lying in football um, the OWGR rankings are, are a big liar as well uh, and you know you talk about random sports 
Mm-hmm. Football's football's random. Golf is incredibly random, and I, I I'm not a big player of golf, but you know people I speak to, you know, one day you you're unbelievable off the tee, the next day you're kind of shanking it into the woods. And um, if you look at the odds going into a golf tournament, you know the the guy who's most likely to win is often only got a kind of maximum fifteen. You know, if he's really really good, maybe twenty percent chance of of winning. Uh, which you know in a football match at least you got you go in you know forty percent chance of winning most games. Uh, and so what that means is that you know golfers can can play reasonably well. They can do get all their approach play and their driving um, in line. And it just comes to the putting, and they're just a little bit off, and they they lose by you know a couple of strokes, whatever. And the way the ranking works, which I guess is kind of in tune with the way that we experience the sport as a fan, in that we love seeing the winners, we like the narrative of the disconnect between the winners and the losers. But the winners get a huge number of points, and anyone who's second, third, it quickly drops off. And so someone, some guy who you know, could play an okay tournament, but because a, a couple of other of his opponents maybe missed a few crucial putts, wins back-to-back tournaments, yeah. um, but actually isn't, isn't so good um, you know, it, it consistently in the long run. Someone else is perhaps consistently getting within the top two or three. Um, that, that player is consistently getting in the top two or three and is, is kind of good in the kind of consistent areas of, uh, of the golfing game might be expected to do better in the long run. And I remember, I so said, we've got a performance index in, in golf where Shane Lowry in the lead up to the Open, his ranking wasn't great, but actually our performance index was saying he was someone who was going to be competitive at the Open and obviously um, he went and won it. So yeah, it's not just exclusive to, spo- uh, to football, it's not exclusive to, to injuries. Like, it's sport. like, um, it, 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 it's, it's very pol- polarized, um, you know, winning, winning and losing a narrative that's built, which I think is the nature of sport. I, you know, I, I often used to say about like uh, coaches and managers in football, then they're a little bit like American presidents. They get the, too much credit when they win and they get too much blame when they lose. Mm. You know, American, American presidents, they, are, they, they get all the credit if the, if the economy is going well and booming. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of random factors in, within, that, within that result. Uh, uh, but at the same time, they get all the blame. Uh, w- which is also not fair when, when, when the economy is not, not going that well. Uh, so I guess, I guess that, that's the nature of sport and that's why it's important to, you know, ha- have something to look at which, you know, predicts maybe performance in, okay. you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the longer perspective. Yeah. And, and just to wrap up, so we focused a lot on the kind of results on the course or on the field yeah. um, or the revenue and so on. But there are, there are kind of other processes that exist within within sport, within football. So, you know, if I think about player recruitment and talent development, you know, injuries, and there's a lot of, lot of kind of areas that, um, you know, departments within clubs are thinking about their outcomes and how they measure it. So, you know, traditionally you might measure recruitment success by looking at your net spend or player sales. And uh, academy might be, you know, based on number of academy first team minutes. What are some of the ways you can think about, I guess, leading indicators in those fields given obviously that there's a time lag yeah i mean and especially when you talk about academy there's a there's a big time lag because your investment in academies there's a real long-term investment right it's not going to pay off in one or two years it might be it's my it's, it's probably a 10-year project uh, um you know so 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 how do you measure the effect of, of that one 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 thing i would say though with with regards to academy that you know, I try and push in the organization. I help run is to like it, like um, it's having a, like Midland, we have a, like an ambition about uh, that 40% of the playing minutes in the first team must be played by um, academy players, like on a rolling five, you know, three to five year basis. So some seasons it's a bit below, some seasons it's, 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 it's a bit above. But the reason I think, uh, I don't, I, I would say, I don't think necessarily that's the right metric for, for all clubs because it depends a lot on on um, on if if you if, if your business model if your if your strategy has an academy at, at its core. Um, um, so, but what I what I would say like the percentage of minutes played, I think is a is a better metric than academy players in the first team squad. Yeah, um, it's a little bit like. If you run a software company, you might sell a lot of software to your clients, but are they actually implementing and using it? Like, or are you just selling unused software licenses to the shelves of the customers? You know, that's why in the software companies, you got this 
metric called adoption rates. You know, how much how, how much of the software you sell are implemented and being used, adopted. Uh, and it's the same thing like with, with academy players, like at the end of the day, the real test is not, is he in your first team squad? The real test is, do you have the courage to play him? Does he get minutes? And, and, and I think that's a good metric to kind of push the organization to, to have that courage and, and, and back them. Uh, because we all know that playing a young player com comes with a risk. So I think that would be maybe a, an, an interesting R number to, to, to discuss in relation to, to, to uh, academies. I also think you mentioned transfers um, and recruitment. Um, you know, most, most, uh, most clubs, like if you're outside the top five in the top five leagues, you know, they have a global fan base and all that. You know, we all, we all kind of depend on being able to drive a profit from, from, from our player trading. Um, and, and, and your, your net transfer income is, 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 a, is a key metric as well for me because it's, uh, it's, it's, it tells you, tells you a lot about how, how effective you are with not only recruiting but also, um, but also developing players. You could even talk about an R number for, for, the, for the football industry as a whole. Like, you know, you've seen, you've seen a big, big growth in the transfer market over the past five, five ten years. What drives that? It's probably the growth you've seen in the broadcasting deals in the five big leagues. You know, that would be a big R number for the football industry is the growth in the broadcasting rights and the deals for, 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 the, for the top five leagues because that's the money that kind of filters into the transfer market and gives a lot of clubs the opportunity to actually be profitable. Yeah, it's a really interesting one, actually, thinking about it. You know, I, I think if you look at the tectonics in football, there's obviously a movement towards, um, you know, greater inequality within the game. And what's interesting is that that doesn't seem to be negatively correlated with viewership for the time being. But there might be certain numbers that if you dig beneath where maybe for the elite games, fewer and fewer fans are watching those games as much. Maybe they're attached to particular clubs. Uh, or maybe, you know, games at certain times of the week or, you know, in certain environments aren't being watched as much. And even though the, the overall macro picture is that the broadcast rights are going up and viewership figures look healthy, it might be that in particular types of matches, the viewership isn't as strong. And that would be the predictor of, you know, fans getting fatigued about, you know, same teams always winning the league or same teams always having the best players and so on. So that's, that, that'd be an interesting one to, to dig into with, with the data. Um, if how I, many if R I, numbers should a, should, should a football club have, do you think, or one? How many R numbers? Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, you want to always tie it to each kind of key vertical of a club. So there's, the, there's the, the kind of first team results, and I think you want to have one key number that does it. And I think, you know, if you go back to the principle of, of COVID and, and the R number, it's really easy to understand, right? It's how many people one person infects. And if it's above one, bad. If it's below one, good. And like you get it straight away. And sometimes I worry a little bit with um, things like expected goals where, A, there's lots of different ways you can look at it. Um, you know, there's different models, there's different ways of calculating it. It's not always the most straightforward, even, even if it might be potentially the best. So, so I often kind of look at even just goal difference or, as I said earlier, you know, number of times you go behind with really straightforward things that also it means any club can do it. You know, if you're, if you're a Premier League club, you can do it. If you're a finished third division club, you, you can do that. So I think one number that kind of um, nails you down to that. Um, if I think about like the academy space as well, um, you know, if, you're, if you haven't got academy productivity today, if you haven't got the proportion of minutes in the first team, but you're expecting that in five years, there are things like, and I know, you know the Premier League have obviously um, been driving the EPPP um, changes um, and a look to influence certain elements within an academy. Things like coaching hours and number of coaches has been a big, a big emphasis. And obviously, you need to have a quality dimension to that as well. But I think metrics like that, you know, the, you can draw a line between, you know, getting more coaches into the system, getting more coaches qualified and so on, that you would expect it to lead to better, better developed players. So focusing on that in the first instance rather than the output because you're not going to have the output for a few years. So I think your, your, what did you call it, the godfather R number is ultimately... Um, is ultimately your one that drives the performances on the pitch and for your first team because they're, they're the, the product that's what drives yeah. revenues. Uh, and then within each area, you know, it's useful thinking about the key drivers of, of individual performance. 
Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely you know I, I was actually asked a question like this on a webinar um, a couple of months ago. Like, what have you learned about statistics in uh, in this coronavirus period? And I think you know what we've spoken about today around the R number is a really good way of uh, thinking about it. Yeah, and I think you know, like like being being uh, identifying a number that 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 is actionable in terms of the future, not not something that just tells you about the past i think is a is probably a key takeaway as well isn't it like you 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 want to you want to you want to have a number that tells you something about you know where you are likely to go rather than you know something that just is um, is is pointing to the past and and um, and yeah that would, that would be another takeaway i think yeah absolutely well thanks rasmus good to chat oh, good to speak to you okay all right speak soon